right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we are joined by the stars of Pray for the Devil. We've got Christian Navarro and Jacqueline Byers. Looking very like, it's like chic, like devilish chic, that, like the vibe that I'm getting from you both right now. Devilish chic. That sounds we're, good. Thank yeah, you. We've got yeah, you're I'm sorry. Christian was like, I'll take it. <laughs> take what you can get out here. He's a little inferno oh, over here. Hot. Got the fuego happening. Yeah, the I fuego. like it. <laughs> Let's talk about the movie. So, <laughs> Let's talk about the movie. <laughs> we're actually just going to talk about this fire fit the whole time. That's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> I'm very curious if you guys were given the chance to either attend or like actually assist with an exorcism. Like, would you take that opportunity? <laughs> no. One hundred percent yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No way. No I'd be no. offended if someone offered. No, no. Oh, I'm fascinated. Yeah. I don't think it would be allowed, but like if somehow I Tom Cruise my way into an exorcism. <laughs> <laughs> so the I body's levitating off the bed and you're just being lowered down. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like how hands on would you want to be? Like how much involvement would you want to have? Like a bystander? Well, I, you to like, do stuff? I would just watch. <laughs> Okay. Like, I can't help, really. <laughs> you wouldn't just, like, try to throw some stuff out there and be like, let me read a verse or two. Like, yeah. you just watch? Like, No, yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would, I would stay in the room. I wouldn't go in. I am yeah. in a very specific set of skills, and that is not that. <laughs> okay. See, I appreciate that. It's good to know, like, what your skill set is and what your limitations are. That's important, yeah, I feel like, yeah, right? It's really important. <laughs> Also, I love that you guys had such like violently like opposite reactions to that question. <laughs> Jacqueline's like, hell yeah, put me in coach. And Christian's like, absolutely the fuck not. <laughs> no, not happening. But see, I'm with you on that. I'm kind of like in like the fuck around and find out camp. And I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to fuck around because I do not need to find out. Like I will mm -hmm. just be over here. That is not probably not my skill set. I don't need to know. <laughs> like, I agree. That's perfectly said. Yeah. But like, like I'm very appreciative of people that are willing to like step into the room and like take on the demon. So thanks. No, no, I don't want to take on the demon. Let's just clarify. Let's do it. I, I just want to be there to watch it happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Behind some plexiglass, like yeah, demon proof maybe. plexiglass. Okay. Maybe. Well, you do get to take on the demon in, in Pray for the Devil, which is really Ooh. cool because we don't ever see a woman like step into the power and do that kind of role. Yeah, well, it's so cool because she's not just doing it the same way the men have done it for years. She's bringing her own approach to exorcism, which I think is the most badass part of her <laughs> character. <laughs> well, she brings a lot of empathy to it, and she's, like, approaching it instead of, like, this is the system and these are the rules and these are the verses that we read. She approaches it as, like... I'm, I'm connecting with the afflicted, which makes so much sense to me. I'm like, okay, women should be allowed to do exorcisms because I feel like naturally that's like how you would probably approach it. Right? <laughs> I think so. It made sense <laughs> to me. But I'm also a fan of Father Dante because I feel like he was like a stellar ally. He was like, I recognize the need for some changes here. And he was like all about like, Sister Anne, get on in here. Like, let's do this shit. Yeah, it's uh, lucky to be to be in a supportive uh, role in the film and 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 here today. I, I'm I'm lucky to be a part of it. Yeah, is that part of what uh, like drew you guys to the project? Is like it's it's a it's a spin on kind of the exorcism films that we've seen before. It's like you get to see like okay, let's see a different approach to how somebody could handle an exorcism. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. Absolutely, it's a different. It's a you know you read the script and you're looking for things that stand out and that's what stands out about it. It's, it's the first of its kind in that regard. And, and uh, Father Dante was, was sort of a fully realized character on paper. And then the conversations I had with the team, the producers and the director afterwards, it was even, uh, it was deepened that much more for me. And I felt like I, I could, ultimately you want to ask yourself, can I do something good in this role? Can I bring mm -hmm. something unique to it? And I thought that I could and-, and um, And he did. Well. And he did, 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did. <laughs> But I also appreciate the fact that there's, we get some kind of backstories. Like, as you said, this is a fully realized character. Like, these are people. I feel like sometimes this thing happens. It's like when you're a kid and you have a teacher and you see them, like, out in the wild at the grocery store. And it's, like, yeah. kind of mind-boggling to be like, oh, you're a person. Like, you have, like, a life. You don't just exist in the classroom. So yeah. Something like a nun or a priest, it's like you exist in that only. And it's like, yeah. oh, no, you, ha you have a mom. You have a sister. Like, you have you a, a life. Yeah. You grocery shop. <laughs> I would love to see 
I would have loved to have seen more of that, right? Exploring them mm -hmm. outside of that, their sort of uh, uh, quote unquote natural environment, seeing them outside of that. I, I think that's very well, uh, yeah. very, very well put, astute. And the friendship that they had as well, like it's very much, it's like, oh, like your your people. Like I would hang out with with uh, Sister Anne and Father Dante, you know. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> We'd hang out with you too. I was like, I don't know if they would hang out with me, but I would want to hang out with. We'll them. hang out with you. Okay. <laughs> cool. What do you think it is about possession films that has like kind of endured as this as this subgenre? Like, what is so fascinating to us about it? Well, I think that there's a huge following, as in like people of the faith. It's a real tangible fear. Um, I think beyond that, which is so amazing about this this film, is it it gets more into the psychological aspect. Uh, you know, what someone brought up earlier, like body horror is so terrifying, you know, and there's just so many aspects to possession because it can be mental, it can be body. There's so many avenues to create that fear. Um, yeah, I, I think fear is one of the most universal, if not the most universal uh, uh, connecting sort of emotion. Uh, everybody knows what it feels like. Everybody goes to the movies and, and um, anticipates those feelings. And so I, I think uh, I think that's probably a reason why it's endured. Fantastic. It, I will say it, it continuously scares the shit out of me. Like exorcisms in possession films, like I said, I'm like, I'm gonna fuck around and find out. No, thank you. Like I'll just yeah. watch it from the safety of my seat. But those are the kind of things I'm like, oh, I gotta like sleep with the lights on tonight. You know, like that's the stuff that like gets in my head and I'm like, oh, it's like yeah. a little uncomfortable. Well, we know what pain feels like, right? So when they mm -hmm. do like contortions or something, it's like you can almost, it it lends it more, it's easier to imagine as an audience member to feel yes. that like, ah, it, uh, it like gets me like, oh. Uh. Or the loss of control too, like not mm -hmm. being able to control your body or your mind and, and like yeah. maybe doing terrible things or terrible things to people that you love or not being able to save someone that you love that's being possessed. Like all of that is just like checks all the boxes for multiple types of fears. <laughs> totally, 100%. All right, last question. Favorite possession film aside from Pray for the Devil? The Exorcist. All right. <laughs> Man, uh, now I'm blanking. The Conjuring 1 or 2. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one at the moment, but uh, the one with the doll. Okay. That's two. Uh, I think that's probably my favorite possession movie. Solid answers. And it's a good week to watch all of these together with Pray for the Devil. It's a yeah. triple feature. Welcome to Combo Fango. Today we are joined by director of Pray for the Devil, Daniel Stam or Stom? Originally it would be Stam, but I Stum. know that I can't ask that of Americans, and we're going with Stam most of the time. No, you can don't don't let us do the bastardized version. Stam, Stam, Stam. Spit at the screen. Yeah, yeah. Stam. Screen it just some. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Daniel. I thought you were a poster at first. I thought you were like the because I saw the Pray for the Devil, and you were like. Holding very still. There, that's beautiful. <laughs> a friend of mine had this idea for Halloween to to put a statue there for the whole month and then replace the statue with themselves and go after people. <laughs> so I could do that as the poster, just come out of the poster. All right, thanks for coming to hang out with us today and talk about Excited. some exorcisms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is very cool. Also, I'm just going to start this off by saying possession films are very scary to me. Like that's something that like, it's hard for me to watch alone at night because it's just, it creeps me out. So. <laughs> are you, a, are you a believer? I am. I was, I was raised Catholic. So I think it just as a kid growing up, any kind of exorcism possession, it's too scary. Yeah. I always feel like for the, for the believer audience, the work has been done for us. The, yeah. the, gro the groundwork for decades. You've been primed for this movie. And then all I have to do is like deliver act two and three and the payoff. And you come in with so much already. That's true, right? Because you're like, all right, the setup has been done. Let's get right into the meat of the story. Yeah, you, yeah. you know you know how it goes. And now we're going to get into like the heinous exactly. shit. Now. And actually our screenwriter is a practicing Catholic, which made this very, very special. Because normally like with Last Exorcism, for example, there was not a single believer on the entire project. Mm. There was not a single person who even believed in God, much less demons and the devil. Yeah. And here the source of it all is a practicing Catholic. So it's like different. Ways. That is interesting. And also what's interesting is we get uh, our protagonist in this is Sister Anne. Uh, she's a female exorcist, well, aspiring exorcist, I guess, um, because women are not permitted to perform 
exorcisms, but she's like, fuck the patriarchy. I have a gift and I want to do this. So right. that was an interesting element to it. Cause we don't ever, we don't ever get that. She's supposed to be like relegated to the sidelines. You're a nun and you, you assist after the exorcism, right? You don't get to actually do like get in there and do like the crazy hard work. So and that changes everything because it's like exorcism is a pretty narrow genre. You know, mm -hmm. how do you do something fresh with the fact that you owe the audience these set pieces? Mm -hmm. That's that's what they paid for. And now you have to find the fresh spin on that stuff. So having a female protagonist was such a gift because suddenly your conflicts are completely different. In an exorcism movie with a priest, you have one conflict, which is the priest against the demon. Mm -hmm. But now you have a nun who first has to battle the patriarchy, has to battle the church and is almost blasphemic in saying it's time for a new approach, guys. You've done this for millennia mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. And you're screaming the same Bible verses in Latin at the, at the demon. And it doesn't matter. Why don't we make this not all about ourselves? It's not about me being the knight in shining armor. It's about me supporting the afflicted and coaching them out of this. It's a more therapeutic approach. So that is more terrifying to the church than any demon or devil is. They can deal with the demons and devils. But the woman that suddenly goes like, move aside, patriarchy, and even, <laughs> even says, I don't need the word of God. Like when she first you know, does her exorcism, that she says, I don't need the priests, I don't need anything male in this. I don't need the male God. I won't even talk to the demon demon. Let me connect to the female victim. And I think we'll be more successful here doing it that way. It's you know, a stunning act of blasphemy that I think should be celebrated. She comes in very empathetic. And it's like almost as if like the demons have evolved through time but the institution to battle the demons has not evolved along with it. <laughs> that is well said. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I have to say what I liked about the script is that they do give the church some credit. They don't just, it doesn't just dismiss the church as stuck in the middle ages, mm -hmm. but it says, okay, they're not, they're not dummies. They are using technology. Mm -hmm. They are using psychiatry, you know, but of course they're, they're, the foundation is still millennia old and they will always go back to that because it's an eternal battle that she's entering. And it has such a, a pizzazz for her to say, there is this line in the movie that I really like where one of the priests says the right of exorcism has been standing as the perceived word of God for millennia and you have notes you know and that's exactly <laughs> what it is she's coming in and she goes like yeah I don't know about this yeah but I just it's just such a great character that made all the difference <laughs> she's she's a really fun character because it's it's, it's that thing of like we want to see like are the best version of ourselves on screen or like what we wish we were, right? Like you want to be, believe that you're like, oh, I, I would love to, to think that I would like stand up and have like a cool line like that. Like I've got some notes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, but really I'd probably just be like, oh, like, okay, you guys go I, ahead I, th I thought you were going to say, we hope that we would stand up to the demon. And I'm like, I would not stand up to the demon. But I like that to you, the one liner is it would be more important in that moment. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I'm a movie nerd. I grew up watching movies. So it's like you always want your life to, to, to imitate art in that way. So I'm right. like, you and picture even, yourself even you saying to, cool If you have to die in that moment, at least die on a good witty one-liner that people will remember. I'm a words girl. I love words. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, as long as my last, we're all going to go at some time. I just right. want my last words to be something badass. And I'm like, That's and fair. I That's it. you should really <laughs> prepare maybe a set of 10 different versions of last words. And then just in the moment when you feel the moment is coming, just have a good one prepared. <laughs> That's not when you want to start thinking, you know, you want to do pre-production on your last words somehow. I love that you assume that I don't have a big ass book and a notes, a specific notes file in my notes app dedicated to Good. like famous last words, possibly. I'm Question glad. Mark? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> thinking ahead, thinking ahead. Sure. Um, another interesting thing about this is it is PG-13 horror, which the last exorcism was as well, right? Is that it intentional or just happened that way? I mean, uh, the official studio line was, let's shoot an R-rated movie, but protect for PG-13. Okay. And I said, that, that is an impossible mission <laughs> because those are two different movies. Mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, if, if a, a head suddenly has to explode gorily <laughs> and splatter, that is a shooting day that, what, you want me to alternatively to shoot it? There, <laughs> yeah. so, but I always feel, and this is genuine, because I obviously know that the horror community is kind of looking down on PG-13 movies. If, if I know I'm shooting a PG-13 movie, then obviously I have to make it as scary as the R-rated movie. I can't just go like, oh, it's a little less scary because mm -hmm. it's PG-13. That's I have to come up with a psychological 
horror and a, an ambience and and a terror that that the R-rated one doesn't have. Like to me, if I watch an R-rated movie, I'm always like, oh, are they falling into the trap of relying on the gore and thinking mm -hmm. that's scary? Because that's not scary. That's different. That's gross right. and effective, but not necessarily scary. Right. So if you have a scary movie that is PG-13, like The Grudge, The Ring, they were PG-13. Mm -hmm. I still wake up screaming from those movies. <laughs> what, a, what a great achievement, you know? So I, I don't think there's anything negative about PG-13 at all if, you, if the movie still ends up terrifying. I don't see it as a negative thing at all. I actually see it as a positive and also kind of like a challenge as a filmmaker because like you said, it's, it's almost like an exercise in what else can we do story-wise right. to make this scarier when we don't have these other things that we can do? Okay, these right. are out, no exploding heads. What else can we do to scare the shit out of the audience? And I and I didn't know it was not an R-rated movie until just a few minutes ago when I was looking some stuff up. And I was like, oh shit, it's PG-13? I didn't but, know. But you had seen the movie. Yes. And it felt to you like an R-rated movie. I just assumed almost everything I watch is R-rated. I didn't, oh, I wasn't watching and thinking like, hmm, is this get an R-rating? Like it didn't even dawn right. on me until I saw Perfect, it. perfect. Yeah. I mean, so then I'm go. like, mission achieved. Yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> but I also appreciate that because that's something I would have been allowed to watch before I was allowed to see R movies. Like I always loved horror, but I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies. This is something that my parents would have been like, yeah, that's okay. And then I would still be like, I can't go downstairs. And they'd right. be like, you're right. banned for a week from horror movies. <laughs> I actually, after Last Exorcism, I watched a YouTube video by a 13 year old who was doing a review of Last Exorcism. <laughs> and it was, it was his first horror movie ever. And it was one of the most impressive things I've ever watched. Or, or one of the most influential because I was like, oh, I got to remember to make movies for that audience because you're yes. always tempted to want to impress your fellow horror filmmakers. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't this novel, wasn't this original, wasn't this, but don't forget the people where it's their first genuine experience. They're not intellectuals. They're not writing a review in the New York Times. They, you owe them an experience for their hour and a half of lifetime and their by now almost 20 Twenty dollars of pocket money <laughs> and you better make that memorable and you have to achieve both you know so you make a movie for those two audiences very very different you have to juggle that somehow i love keeping that kid in mind though i feel like that's yeah. what makes it that that's that's the point of it right like that's the core of it and now i think also with like social media so everything is so like accessible so it's like you can see instantly what like like critics and like things are saying but it's like well also think about that 13 year old kid like that's <laughs> and now um, it's such a blast to me to read Twitter. I know I'm not supposed to, but to think that there is a 13 year old in Cambodia. I'll never go. I've never been to Cambodia. I know nothing about Cambodia. And he probably has a first date with a girl that he might marry in this movie. And the movie has traveled to a part of the world that I will never. It's the most beautiful thing to me. It's incredible. To me, that's the most exciting part. And that's the part to hold on to. Because I'm like, you're also, that's who you're also making movies for, you know? <laughs> that's whom you are making the movie for. Yes. You just have to, you have to get your ego out of the way that wants to get good reviews. I, I, I can't free myself from that. I love getting good reviews because I'm like, oh, they are appreciated. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, there are just tens of thousands of people out there who will, exp whose head you will be in for an hour and a half and that's what matters. No one cares in the end about the reviews or the box office or any of that stuff. There are people that will carry images that you have created with all these other talented people, not me by myself, um, for them to, to put it into their brain and they will carry it around with them for the rest of their life, some of them. How incredible and what a, what a responsibility. You know? Holy shit, there's no better ending than that. I'm like, that was beautiful. You brought that up beautifully. All right. I know we're out of time, but this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good Ada. luck. Break a leg. Go and scare the shit out of all the 13-year-olds in Cambodia and across the world. <laughs> we'll, we'll do. All right. Pray for the Devil is in theaters.